so. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, go ahead and get started. So I'm Nate Subra uh, from uh, Des Moines, Iowa. You can talk about me in a little bit. So we're going to talk about honeypots tonight. Thank you. I like the sign. He's got a big sign that tells me to eat the mic. So, so. So the, the title of tonight's talk is called Honeypots a Primer. So we're going to be covering a lot of different bases with honeypots. Uh, basically, the whole point of this talk is to kind of get everyone started and realize some of the potential out there. So hopefully we'll hit things for every uh, knowledge level, uh, talk about a couple implementations, and uh, get you guys started uh, potentially building one at home. So, All right. So I've got B jokes on almost every slide. Well, some of them. So I hope you guys enjoy. Just a little bit about me. So I am a red teamer for uh, Lidos Commercial Cyber. I well, used to be a red teamer, now I'm a purple teamer. And what that means is I have to fix everything I break. It sucks. So no. <laughs> uh, started out blue. Uh, can't, uh, went full circle. So all right. All right. So I just wanted to have a quick segue. Talk to some of the other sectors, some people about uh, jumping in. So uh, Greg uh, Hetrick from uh, Cedar Rapids gave a really good kind of nod to this last month, and I wanted to uh, try and keep that up. So I just wanted to give you guys a, just a quick two or three minute talk about imposter syndrome. So uh, let everyone know, so I'm a red teamer. I work for a Fortune 20 uh, company, uh, do a lot of big implementations. Uh, I hate being up talking in front of people. I hate uh, talking about things that I've built because all I can think about is the 100 errors that I ran into before I got to this talk. So I just wanted to bring that up a little bit. So there's a lot of people in here that have probably started out very small, uh, have started out, uh, you know, uh, maybe thinking you don't know what you're doing. But we all uh, came into this uh, career field somehow. So I just want to encourage people to uh, understand that there is, uh, you know a lot more than you think you know. And if you don't, it's OK to ask. So. Just <laughs> when I say quick segue, I meant like three or four slides, maybe six. So uh, just uh, why is it such a big deal in InfoSec? So this is something I've noticed really early on in my IT uh, career when I j made the jump in information security. Uh, InfoSec is combative by nature. So we you use a lot of words even like exploit, own, capture. It's offensive, right? We're actually going mano a mano with uh, the bad guys. So just that whole nature of it is very uh, combative. We're, you know, we actually fight. So whereas like IT, you're fighting machine. In InfoSec, we are actually you know, facing other people, opponents, real actual opponents. So uh, some other things too is you know, we're very critical in information security. I mean, we've all uh, probably had the dumb user talk uh, in IT, but you hear it a lot in information security. And it's actually pointed out a lot of those smart IT people, right? Dumb engineers, dumb system, system admins. You know? So uh, that's a very common way to talk in information security, very bad way to talk in information security. Um, so how can we fix it? So uh, first one, I just encourage everyone to always be OK saying you don't know. That's fine. Everyone started somewhere. Uh, there are things that I don't know how to do. I am terrible at most programming. So there are certain things that I can do very well. There are other things that I can't even sit down and read. So there are probably areas that a lot of people would be like, wow, you don't know that? That's very basic stuff. So uh, I never went to college. I went straight into the career field. So there's a lot of holes in my knowledge that I consider to be very big gaps, but uh, it's OK to say you don't know. And that actually prevents a lot of issues down the road. Um, don't tolerate bad behavior. So that's a big one. You've seen it a lot at the information security cons. Uh, you know, we've, if you see somebody doing something stupid or bad, if you don't do anything, you're letting that. You're accepting that that's happening. So uh, be that person that says stop. So give feedback. Uh, so if somebody is doing something wrong, let them know what they are doing in a nice way. So uh, some of us have a little bit of salty personality, so that can be a little bit difficult at times. Uh, but I just encourage you to work on that. That's a acquired skill. So be watchful of personal bias. So that is something that uh, we always need to be uh, constantly challenging. As a red teamer, that's something I became very aware of uh, working in the field for the last several years. Is just there's a lot of things that I've assumed and built on those assumptions that uh, I'm uh, mindful to challenge myself every day. Um, accept feedback. So if somebody's giving it, uh, you should at least give it a listen and be open to that feedback. Um, it's a natural reaction to be defensive. Uh, it's a natural reaction to uh, defend work that you've done uh, and not want there to be issues with that. So being able to be open to that is a critical skill. Um, collaborate. So that's something that uh, InfoSec, we have 
a lot of people that are social. We have a lot of people that aren't. So for me, it's really easy to go sit at my desk for 12 hours and bang on something and not talk to anyone. Maybe a couple words on Slack here and there, some jokes you know, thrown in, poking fun at James or something like that. But at the same time, uh, you know, uh, I bring in people. I, I want them to see uh, how I work so they can provide feedback on that. And then also see, too, uh, getting from point A to point B, there's 20 missteps along the way. I'm not perfect when I build stuff. So <clears throat> um, security is process improvement. So there's a lot. Of, I've worked in DevOps. I've worked in uh, Sec DevOps. Uh, so we hear a lot of lingo like fail fast, you know, agile, stuff like that. Uh, I look at personal processes, working in security, and this culture issue, it's the same thing. So being able to uh, admit to mistakes fast and correct the problem fast, and having a pipeline, so points where you get feedback and, and check on things, that's, that's what's important, making it a repeatable process. So, uh, and lastly, uh, well, not lastly, one more. Uh, people aren't machines, mistakes happen. We have cosmic rays, bits will flip, stuff will reboot at the wrong time, so we can plan for that, but stuff happens. Uh, burnout happens. Um, so just be understanding, so not everyone's perfect. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to mention that's really important to me too is somebody that's had mental health issues previously, uh, I think it's really important to uh, be able to talk about it openly in the information security community. We have a lot of people that have done a lot of, a lot of uh, really hard work in this industry, and there's a lot of burnout and uh, stigma just around being able to go to somebody for help. So just want to uh, bring that up so that there are resources out there. Um, this is something that uh, it is difficult to talk about, but it's something that we should all be open to the possibility of and understand that it is okay to go to other people for help for that. So, all right, honeypots. So, uh, to start off, so I've been working with honeypots uh, on the defensive side for probably four or five years on the offensive side, uh, two or three, and uh, dabbled with them back when I was a system admin. So what is a honeypot? Uh, it's a computer security mechanism, uh, to detect, deflect, or counteract unauthorized use, which I don't like that description because I'm a red teamer and it says un unauthorized use, that's my job. So when I use honeypots offensively, so, uh, but it can't just be unauthorized use. So a lot of different terms are being thrown around the industry. You'll see up top there, that's workable regex. So I'm really proud of that. It took me years to get to that point. And yes, I still check it in the website. So, <clears throat> um, but there's so many different terms going around that they actually wrote a white paper about honeypot terminology. There's literally like a 50 page white paper on all the terms used in honeypots. So I just wanna bring that to your attention. Like there's a lot to this uh, uh, and there's a lot of buzzwords and in industry stuff that gets thrown around. So, uh, and you'll notice the uh, date on this paper where they had all these issues with this terminology was in 2003. So that's, you know, pre buzzwords, pre industry, getting just, you know, uh, a lot of vendor talk, stuff like that. So, I mean, I'm sure we've fixed it you know, by now. There's no new, you know, it's not confusing anymore. Right? No, nah, no. Nah. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. So for tonight, I'm going to, I say words interchangeably because that's what they mean to me. So for tonight, when I talk about a honeypot, it's a computer system <laughs> that something is running on. And that honey token is a, not a computer system. That's basically what it boils down into. You'll hear all of these different terms like honey creds, honey token, all, you know, that's what it is. It's just one, one is a uh, system, the other one is data. So they all fall under those two big buckets. Uh, so, and I use them interchangeably in those two columns. Yeah, so Nate's definition. So um, Honeystar, uh, things that deceive targets for the benefit of their owners. And I rewrote that myself. I'm gonna keep making that Wikipedia edit until somebody leaves it alone. No, but because red teams use these offensively. So it's not just for defenders. Uh, that's something I wanted to highlight. So. You know, I'm going to be that person that doesn't make up a new term. I'm going to, uh, we're going to change the old one. So, two generally accepted types of honeypots. So, production and research. Uh, production, uh, these are ones that, uh, working in a red and blue environment, if the light goes off on these, that means something really bad is happening, and that light should uh, rarely to never go off. So, they're meant to be close proximity detection. Then you have research honeypots, which we're going to talk about tonight. These are, um, basically kind of long range, you can generate your own threat intelligence, and we're gonna talk about setting one of those up later tonight, and I'll walk you through the different phases that I had uh, in learning and setting one of these up personally, so. All right, so some key things to know. So uh, some of you are probably like, you know, I know all these. It took me a couple of years to actually like lock onto some of these concepts and understand the, some of the big differences. So uh, you have interaction levels uh, for honeypots. You have low, 
which is limited to no interaction. It's there, it listens, it can probably do enough to negotiate a connection, but that's pretty much it. So it's just designed as kind of a simple warning flag. So then you have medium, which uh, emulates some key bits. Uh, so for example, a good example of a medium interaction honeypot would be Cowrie, which can emulate uh, SSH, and it actually uh, passes back and forth like a faux file system. You can run commands on it, but it's not a real system. So, and then you have high. Uh, so these are pretty rare. I'm not even uh, fully, I'm not aware of any fully high like open source uh, honeypot systems out there. They're very difficult to maintain. There were a couple attempts at open source projects. Um, I don't think there's anything that's actively maintained, but this is something that uh, I built for like custom projects. Like if there's environments we know that somebody bad is in, we're gonna spin up a Linux box throw a whole bunch of EDR and tracking on it and be able to look at payloads and, and analyze every single command and interaction that our opponent has with that box. So, and then I added the nice little red arrow, so generally uh, the higher interaction you go, there's more cost implementation, maintenance, and generally higher risk. So something that's emulated, it's a lot harder to hack into to exploit. Uh, so something that's high, there's gonna be security gaps just like any computer system, so. Uh, types. This is kind of a little bit of a misnomer, so I'll talk about some of the specific uh, honeypot services, we're gonna call them that. So uh, various honeypot projects, I guess would be a better word for it. Um, generally, they're categorized by their interaction level and what they actually are targeting. So ADB Honey is a fairly new one, so it emulates an Android ADB service running over TCP IP, which is a thing. Uh, there's, uh, if you stand up a honeypot and run this on the internet, there are people actively spraying ADB payloads to people's Android phones that have ADB turned on for some reason, accessible over the open internet. So, um, uh, so that's an example of a low interaction honeypot. It's capable of basically accepting that connection and a payload, um, and it's targeted specifically to that service. And then we have ConPot is another good example of a low interaction. So it emulates various ICS devices, so very low, I wanna say you can do Modbus and uh, a couple other things on it. It's been a while since I've actually dug into that one because ICS hasn't been my target zone right now. Um, you have Dianea, which is uh, very widely used. It can do a lot. So I just wanted to bring that up as an example of uh, when somebody says stand up a honeypot, well, they're usually meaning a lot of different services, a lot of different pieces of software running to generate logs. So I'm tying that all together. Uh, honeypot logging. Uh, if you did this 10 years ago, logging kind of sucked. And I mean, logging kind of sucked uh, across the industry as a whole <laughs> uh, 10 years ago. Uh, it's gotten a lot better. Uh, nowadays, you can generally get JSON and CSV output from uh, most pieces of Honeypot software. Um, a lot of uh, modern Honeypot software uh, will do logging frameworks. Uh, for example, HP feeds, uh, you can actually export use to uh, Ceph. Like, it can go straight into, uh, straight into a lot of sims. Uh, you can export to uh, basically a predefined Splunk format. So the, there's been a lot of advances in this. It's pretty easy to actually plug them into most sims nowadays. So, and then just some idea, uh, give you guys some general ideas of some of the things you, that are publicly available right now to uh, services that you can emulate using honeypots or services that you can capture using honeypots. So RDP VNC and RD, RDPY, there's actually a new project that can do a lot more than that. Uh, they have Elasticsearch, there's MongoDB, uh, various web applications, which a lot of the web applications one, you can actually jam in your own web application and have it uh, kind of emulate a specific web application. Uh, you have some new projects like Glutton, uh, which is pretty cool. It can actually dynamically listen on any port on a machine and it'll spin up a listening port. So if somebody attempts to connect to that and it doesn't know what that port is, it'll still open up that port and just listen and log that connection at any, any traffic that's sent. So you don't even have to necessarily emulate, emulate a specific service. So uh, and then you have various, so Honeytrap is kind of the old version of Glutton, not as powerful. You have MedPot, which is pretty cool, FHIR, uh, something health uh, information. It, it's use, actually used for transmitting uh, medical data. So it's a standard that was, that was written up. So uh, it, it gets hit quite a bit out there. I'd like to know uh, who has uh, open medical devices running on the internet, but that is a thing. So. And they have Cowrie uh, that can do SSH, Telnet, FTP. So a lot of different services available out there. Um, there's SMB, there, there's quite a few. Point is that uh, if you're looking to target a specific service or thing, uh, it's available. So uh, general placement. So uh, <clears throat> for production sensors, uh, having 
put these in in several environments, uh, your edge is generally pretty noisy. Uh, you know, uh, set up a honeypot and put it next to some web servers and running on a specific port. So it's going to get all the, that same spam, all that uh, internet scanning traffic that uh, most of your uh, uh, production servers do. So uh, I've seen some really good implementations there, but it takes a lot of care and feeding to, uh, number one, stand that up, tune all the alerting, and keep that viable. Where my opinion uh, is is that uh, inside is where uh, production honeypots uh, work really well. Um, and we'll talk about a couple uh, use cases there. Um, they generally require some tuning. Um, they're really good at detection. So if you have a honeypot on the inside that is never supposed to go off and it goes off, that is a high fidelity, high value alert. So, and uh, you'll see that bullet point whitelist your vulnerability scanners there because I have seen more than one uh, sock get woken up in the middle of the night because somebody's Nessus scan hit the honeypot and it, they didn't have the exception in their alerting logic. So we'll talk about that more later. <clears throat> All right, general placement research. Um, so high traffic, uh, you generally want to try and maximize your collection. So um, uh, just jump back here and caveat a little bit. So uh, this was supposed to be a, a much longer talk uh, they had a gap tonight in the, the talking schedule that I wanted to come and come in. I have a CFPN for B-side, so hopefully we'll actually talk about some of these techniques and actually selecting some of these locations. But generally, you want a high traffic location. Um, I use a website called Expired Domains to, um, that can show you the like, previous Alexa, the top 100 rankings. So I have several domains that I've purchased that uh, have a lot of uh, uh, links to them, have a lot of uh, uh, referrals. So that, that's a good way to drive up traffic to your honeypots. <coughs> um, you can tune them to collect and only emulate under uh, specific circumstances. We'll talk about that under a little bit under when we get to the red team. Um, and generally use this on uh, IP space outside your org. So you're generating threat intelligence with this, but it's usually not specific to your organization. So um, more B jokes. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, a lot of people say that uh, honeypots are a very difficult topic for a lot of IT and security departments. Um, there's a lot of security concerns. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, are we at the right maturity to implement a honeypot? Uh, I think that uh, landscape has changed a little bit in the last two or three years. Uh, really what honeypots allow for, and you, they've rebranded it again, it's called the deception technology because it sounds way cooler than honeypot. Um, so, uh, it, it allows for additional reaction time to threats. So whether we're using that long range on a research honeypot that's sitting on the outside of the internet, collecting techniques that people are spraying around or attackers are trying to hit, um, you know, that allows us to look at that behavior, uh, build a defense for it, and implement it before it hits our environment. So uh, close proximity, again, that allows for um, detection for high-risk assets. And we'll talk about a couple different uh, implementations for that later. Um, and honeypots allow for offensive and defensive research to occur at a lower cost and risk. So um, I'll hit on it a little bit later, but uh, I've seen a lot of environments where the SOC process is literally stare at the blinky light. If it's not blinking, everything's okay. You wait for it to go off, and then you kick out that IR process. So honeypots are a, uh, research honeypots are an excellent, excellent implementation for environments like that. Um, if you wanna keep your analysts sharp, give them something to do, and actually give them real attack data. You know, real live information. These are something you can stand up. And by the way, setting one of these up is cheaper than any other blue team tool that you can buy, period. I guarantee it. So <laughs> these, are, these are low cost, high fidelity. At, at the worst, you're giving your analysts real data to, uh, to look at. Um, and again, the better that you can target this in your environment, the higher fidelity data you can generate, the, the better uh, threat intel you can generate. Uh, the more useful you can make it to your analysts. So uh, honeypots can slow down the opposing team. Uh, I am of the opinion that everything comes down to money because that's how it works. Even in the red team side of it, it comes down to uh, how much money we want to spend to hack somebody. So uh, th there's a cost to everything. Uh, so time is money. Um, if you slow me down on an engagement when I have two weeks to complete a task and I'm supposed to be out of that environment, then getting stuck in a honeypot or you know, banging my head against something uh, for a couple hours or getting kicked out of a system because somebody picked me up scanning a honeypot, uh, that, you know, that's costing me money. So a lot of people don't look at it like that way. They see attackers as this blind face. Attackers have budgets, schedules, time issues, time constraints, bosses, uh, kids, 
stuff like that. So, um, and then uh, they can slow down the blue team too, and we'll talk about some offensive implementations uh, later down the road, but um, I've had a lot of good success actually tying up IR teams uh, with uh, a lot of the same techniques that they try and tie us up with. So it's like tunnel vision sometimes, I guess, when you're blue team, if you're trying to look back at red team, forget some of the things that you do on the inside. <coughs> All right. All right, so blue, and again, we've talked about some of these points. Uh, give your, uh, your analysts a chance to actually look at real attacks. Um, uh, one of the things I've seen uh, several companies do very successfully is actually uh, uh, standing up their IDS rules uh, on an outside honeypot and testing them against real world attacks again. So if you want to see what that alert looks like or what kind of data is generated in a non-production environment, um, it's, this is a lot cheaper way to do it. Um, uh, generating your own threat intel. Uh, I mean, we all pay thousands and thousands of dollars for TI feeds, or, or uh, some of us want to. Uh, you can get some pretty good fidelity uh, using your own honeypots, and you're generating data that is specific to you, so depending on, on your placement. So, or at the very least, it's, it's no less generic than you are uh, paying for somebody else's feed. So, uh, yep, and then again, in-house expertise using real data uh, is invaluable. Um, for red, uh, so uh, again, some of this is, is not as polished as I like. There's a lot more techniques I wanted to dig in here, but uh, I would have to lock you in this room for 12 hours, and we don't have all night. So um, uh, this, for me, as a red teamer, uh, I use honeypots. I've seen several brand new techniques in the wild. Uh, people say it hits Twitter first. Well, no, it hits somebody's honeypot, and then they go talk on Twitter. So that's usually how new stuff is found. So you'll see stuff same day, get that, get that extra jump on being able to analyze the technique. Uh, been able to jump in and actually use a brand new technique uh, as a red team. Uh, you, uh, so that's one of the difficulties with red team in, uh, in an environment is sometimes you're waiting for a zero day. So if a zero day comes out and you're waiting for it and you can put it in right away before people get their defenses in place, that can be invaluable. Um, it allows you to analyze uh, somebody else's TTPs so I can watch somebody hack a box um, and then see what they do. And, and then also uh, we've actually done uh, Tabletop exercises using honeypot, uh, honeypots as a red team, walking through uh, where the attacker messed up. Basically, kind of like a Mystery Science Theater 3000 red team version. So it's great. Um, and actually pretty effective. It's a good way to brainstorm, generate new techniques um, and ideas. So um, click intel on targets. We'll talk about this. This is, this is one uh, that I've used pretty successfully, too. Um, uh, a lot of people, again, they think honeypot and they think uh, trying to catch an attacker, it's a great way to basically uh, sinkhole uh, things that you uh, control and collect information on your target. So, uh, so I want to talk about some real world, I call them user stories. Uh, it's not 100% accurate, but these are some implementations that I've seen used pretty successfully and some of the challenges we ran into. Um, so, uh, a lot of companies, uh, want to stand up honeypots, they don't understand what that means. So this is probably one of the more effective implementations. If you're thinking about setting up a honeypot in a corporate environment, uh, you want something that is gonna provide a high fidelity alert. Um, so, and this is a good example of that. So for this particular business, uh, they stood up a, uh, a low interaction SSH honeypot, and uh, I'll, I can talk more to the technical details uh, after when we get to the questions if you want, but, um, uh, so, and they, they put it in their DMZ, uh, and uh, it, they actually had an attacker compromise one of their web servers and try to do lateral movement, and they were scanning that environment, and they were able to alert on that, find the compromised server, and shut it down because of that honeypot in place. So there's an example of a high fidelity, low cost alert. So it was, their cost implementation was literally uh, getting that, uh, that uh, IP space plumbed out to their DMZ, and then, uh, again, some of the alerting logic, uh, the SOC lost some sleep on this one, uh, but uh, once they got the uh, exclusions figured out in their alerting logic, uh, they were able to uh, you know, rapidly convert this into something that is a very great, uh, we already used the F word, it, uh, this is a good oh no shit alarm. Like if this goes off, something is wrong. Either this happens doing something stupid, which is, uh, I think that's an alarmable action too. Um, so. And again, not because he's dumb, it's just because it's a learning opportunity. So, um, and then uh, there was a little bit of cost to figuring out how to get the alert uh, into their workflow, get it into their SIM, so like how they wanted to ingest that. So, because they wanted this one to go to the top of the list. So, there was a little bit of heartache there. I wouldn't say the tech technical implementation was 
difficult, but it was just prioritizing it and uh, uh, understanding where this should fall in alerting. Honey ports. This one's actually really fun uh, because the engagement that I was on, this got me caught. So and anytime I get caught, I learn everything I can about that because it is good. This is a good low, lower cost implementation, I'll say, for environments where uh, you may have host firewalls turned on, but you, you're not able to ingest those logs. Um, so uh, the implementation I saw was a, uh, and I actually helped implement this after the fact, so I've got some uh, good understanding there of some of the challenges, uh, was uh, they had a company that had a lot of different branches, uh, and they had user segments that they didn't have, weren't able to do a lot of alerting and monitoring on, um, and so they had fairly, they were fairly confident in their EDR and their and their client side stuff, but they were worried if one box got compromised and somebody was sneaky enough, how would they catch somebody like pivoting around in that network? You know, what was their next uh, layer of defense? So they actually created a GPO on the domain, and uh, you can do port forwarding on a Windows box. By the way, this is a great registry key to monitor. <laughs> because um, that's what NetSH actually modifies when you actually do a port forwarding role in Windows. Um, so, and uh, if you hit this port in any way, it would forward that back to the actual honeypot that was running in a secure segment. So uh, it could uh, receive uh, connections, receive related connections, but it couldn't talk back out. So it's fairly low risk, right? So they got that thing locked down. Um, and the, the port actually was low interaction. It couldn't do anything. So. Uh, one of the reasons it was built like that was because uh, something like this requires IT bind, you're talking routes, you're talking network segmentation, but this provided some really, really good uh, high fidelity alerts. Um, uh, one of the first uh, things that you do as a red teamer is uh, you start looking at that local terrain. So I pop a user segment box, I'm gonna start looking around and seeing what is adjacent to me, what other machines are, are next to me. Um, so, uh, Something like this uh, is going to trip up uh, a lower maturity red team. So if you're just, I'm going to end map this whole network, and you know, because most people don't actually have any tools in place to d detect, uh, excuse me, d d d yeah, detect that. Pause for effect. So, uh, and you know, we don't all have the the cash to throw at scanning, uh, you know, monitoring end map in a user segment. So you know, that's not crossing any boundaries. Uh, this was actually uh, able to trip up quite a few different pen test teams, red teams, uh, because again, uh, that's, you know, uh, that uh, this isn't a very standard implementation, I would say, to start. Um, there have been quite a few teams, I think, that have keyed onto this, but it slows you way down. I can't just broadly scan for this. I have to be very cognizant of the ports I'm looking at, and I have to understand that uh, even if I see a Windows host and it has a port open on it, that could still set off a flag somewhere. That could still get me booted out of the environment. So um, the challenges for implementing this is uh, it was a uh, it's mid mid size enterprise. So uh, it, the politics weren't too bad to getting this implemented. You know, there's some hemming and hawing to actually uh, getting this set up, testing it. Uh, but uh, and again, vulnerability scanning exceptions. Uh, this got set off quite a bit because you know it looked you know vulnerability scanners look for SQL apparently or something. So. Um, uh, there was a little bit of, of uh, not politics, but just procedures to update there, um, some uh, learning to tune, but um, just a, a good uh, concept to be aware of is you don't have to necessarily stand up a honeypot in a segment uh, that you want it in. You can use a box that's already there to relay it back to something, so. Uh, red team target analysis. So this is something I do actually more often than not. Um, so this is a good example. I found a... Uh, DNS subdomain that could be hijacked, so it was a, a C name pointing to a domain that was expired, so I was able to buy that domain, stand it up, and uh, it had been expired for like six months, so I was pretty sure it wasn't actively used. Didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on it, so I pointed it, uh, pointed it at a, a VPS, you know, uh, ran TCP dump for a little bit, just saw it was out there, but uh, I knew I was gonna use that probably later on, didn't need it right that point, so stand up a honeypot, uh, run some services on it and uh, roll that to some of the, the monitoring and alerting I have set up for the red team because we use it too. And, uh, you know, it's something that I can just sit there and, and passively collect information on. So there's honeypots that can collect email too as well. So it's a, just a good low-cost way to, I don't want to set up an entire mail infrastructure. I just need something to be able to eat mail. Okay, that, the honeypots can do that. So um, there's definitely some risk here to um, uh, being detected. So that's one of the challenges I listed. But otherwise, uh, there's 
literally uh, no reason not to do something like this outside of it potentially uh, being the only way into your environment. You might treat that a little bit more careful. So, but as a way to uh, not sinkhole a domain, but to monitor a domain and keep it active. So, um, one of the other things we did with this was uh, actually had Nginx running and uh, had it proxying, and we would uh, actually set up alerts for any time our targets uh, specific. IP space and user agents were in there, and we redirect them back to our phishing infrastructure. So anyone else would get the Honeypot page. Uh, the people that we actually wanted, we would get notified if they connected to this, and then we would uh, we would redirect them back to where we want to go. So a target of opportunity. Um, but so just one of the one of the ways that uh, a red team can yeah, potentially use a uh, Honeypot offensively, uh, or it's just a, w a low cost way to collect uh, information on a target. So, all right, so uh, again, I'm short a couple diagrams that I really wanted to have in here. I just want to talk about some of the ways I got started. So now that I've uh, maybe uh, piqued some interest on the topic and, and got some brains turning on, hey, we could maybe plug this in in our environment or this, this would be a valuable uh, use case. So um, one of the cheapest ways and easiest ways just to get started with the honeypot is to set up, set up your own uh, research honeypot. So, and I'm gonna walk you through a couple of the steps I did uh, getting where I am today uh, with what I run personally. So not much, not real shop talk, but this is what I run at home, and it's, I'm glad my girlfriend doesn't watch the stream because I have an excessive uh, uh, cloud budget for myself. We'll talk about some ways that I minimize that. So uh, when I first got started, uh, so there's, uh, there weren't really a whole lot of uh, like Raspberry Pi or ARM, uh, ARM-based uh, honeypot software. So I was running a Raspberry Pi with Cowry and I had my home router port forward SSH back to that. So, you know, lo, you know just see what's out there. So uh, that's why I don't run SSH on port 22 anymore, um, uh, ever, it just it, because you get spammed. I, I didn't really run it. Obviously, I had port 22 available, but uh, standard ports, there's so much traffic scanning on the internet, it's ridiculous. So we'll, I'll show you guys what it looks like. So I built a honeypot just for this talk. It's been up for a couple days. You're gonna be hopefully surprised how many hits there are on it. So uh, some issues with the Pi. So I wanted more ports, uh, but there was stuff out there that I wanted to capture that I was using. So uh, yeah, you kind of get in the way, right? Like I don't want to interfere with my operations. So I didn't want to intercept that. And then the limited capacity of the Pi, because I think this was back in like the Pi one day, so slow. So phase two, and uh, I should add a time scale to this. So this is, uh, when I say implementation, this was probably like, uh, a couple different renditions of this uh, in over the course of a, a year or two. So, so phase two, I, I, I'm like, okay, uh, cloud provider, I'm standing up my own BPS, you know, $5 a month, okay, whatever. I've got Diana and Cowrie on it, and then I'm uh, pulling the logs back with rsync because I didn't know any better at the time, so no comments. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, see, learning. Okay to not know. Uh, and then uh, I was uh, pulling those into an elk stack at home, and then just, uh, that's, that's how I would look at my analysis, like who's doing what out there. Um, resource consumption, and that's on the cloud side. So some of these uh, honeypots are actually pretty uh, intensive as far as what they do. So my $5 a month VPS uh, would get maxed out on resources, it would bog down, uh, you know, I'd just be constantly trying to tune it. Oh, it only comes with 20 gigs of space for logs. That'll rotate logs out in a day or two, maybe. So, you know, just, I, I didn't want to, uh, it, was a, it was a pain in the ass, so. Um, uh, so, yeah, and I had, uh, there was a piece of software that I wanted to, that I'm gonna uh, show you guys tonight, it's called Teapot. So uh, it's somebody, uh, that's another slide I need to add, it's somebody that's put together basically a package of Honeypot software and a lot of tuning. So, but that piece of software in particular costs eight gig gigabytes a month, uh, which if I uh, purchased that in AWS or Azure, you're talking like anywhere from 80 to $100 a month for that. If I do a cheaper cloud provider, it's still probably $20, $30 a month on, on the outside, so. Um, it, it's, that was prohibitive to me for, I mean, that's beer money, so no. <coughs> uh, so, and you know, I had that delaying analysis. I like real-time data. I like being able to, uh, you know, right away, come on. So, uh, so this is what I basically run now, and it took me a while to get here. Uh, we're gonna talk about a couple things. Uh, there's supposed to be a diagram here, again, so I couldn't make it how I wanted it. So uh, I'll walk you guys through it, and then we'll actually go to the demo, so. Um, so I have a hybrid implementation with Teapot and Zero Tier. So Teapot is uh, a Honeypot distribution that's actively maintained. It's based on Ubuntu, um, and it's made by T-Mobile Germany. So uh, it is probably one of the most polished 
uh, pieces of software that I've seen pull all the components together. So a lot of people have heard of MHN or Money, uh, Modern Honey Network, uh, uh, developed by ThreatStream. So uh, I actually prefer Teapot. There's a couple things I don't like about it. We can talk about that later. Um, so anyway, uh, my steps are, and again, uh, you guys get to bypass all my trial and error getting to this point. So I find the cheapest, smallest VPS provider out there I can find, preferably with IPv6. So, and then I install either Debian or I've actually done OpenWRT uh, instances, which uh, OpenWRT is uh, I generally use for like home routers or ARM. Uh, it's third party firmware you can flash. They have an x86, x86 version of it. Uh, it's great. I had the whole thing, including NetFlow, VPN, and it had a 30 megabyte uh, memory footprint. So, kind of a nerd. But, so, I can, uh, I've, I've stood this up on in environments with 128 megs of RAM sitting on the internet. I'm basically. Uh, I think the cheapest one I found is a dollar a month, so I'm basically paying for that IP. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and you know, one dollar a month, so that's twelve dollars a year plus the domain. That's you know, that's like thirty-six packs I can afford now, more than I could before. So, <clears throat> so I have a, I have a pretty decent uh, size home lab, so uh, you know, I have more than enough resources to run Teapot at home. So, um, but you know, I didn't want to use my home IP, so I have a Honeypot VM running at home on its infrastructure. And it's not really isolated any more than, uh, than most of my stuff. It, it has its own uh, vSwitch, so it has its own virtual switch it's segmented on. Um, and I have a bridge VM that sits uh, between internet access and that honeypot switch. And that uh, bridge VM connects to zero tier. So I'm going to segue into zero tier a little bit. Zero tier is a uh, open source uh, SDN implementation. Um, it's free uh, for personal use. Um, uh, it's free if you can set up your own infrastructure. But anyway, what it allows you to do is uh, do completely software-defined networking for free. Um, so I can actually do a layer two switch between two environments, so using this. So uh, basically what I did is I stood up a switch between uh, that Honeypot V switch and my VPS. So, um, and there's no other connections uh, between that uh, Honeypot VM uh, so it, it's forced to go out the zero tier route through that virtual switch that's set up, that zero tier switch, out to the VPS, and I have everything added to that. So I have an IP on the outside connected to a uh, honeypot that has as much resources as I can throw at it. Um, and then I can also connect multiple uh, VPSs to that uh, vSwitch and just keep stacking IPs. So if you want to know how to double your honeypot logs, just add more IPs to your VPS. You double the traffic, so you get a lot more hits. So uh, I've got a couple out there, I think, that are running six or seven IPs. Uh, I see a lot of log churn through those, but you can uh, add them from multiple providers. So uh, we'll take a look here. I think I've got four or five on my zero tier network uh, that I have set up for this right now. Um, but it's a really good way to uh, you know, triple your attack surface, which is the goal with honeypots, uh, without uh, paying a lot for it, uh, which is great when you have a girlfriend or significant other or uh, just like to drink beer. So, all right, so last B joke. All right, so first off, we're going to talk about uh, Teapot a little bit first before I dig too much in. So Teapot is again, it's made by T-Mobile Germany, uh, T-Mobile Duschland. Uh, so it straps together. Let me blow this up a little bit. So it straps together all of these different honeypots and uh, uses a, a centralized logging tool. So the guy has uh, very extensive, extensive log stats customizations that allow this uh, to be analyzed. And it also is fully self-contained, which is good and bad. So it actually, uh, uh, you can go out to GitHub, download the ISO for this, stand it all up, and it's working. There's literally nothing else to do outside if you need to manage your network connectivity and you know, get the bad guys to this. So um, it's completely self-contained. Um, they're working, and, and it's, it's all running on Docker too, so it's very well isolated internally. Um, so, uh, very awesome piece of technology, and it is an amazing way to jump into honeypots and understand the uh, fidelity that you can get and just the, the, the use cases, uh, the, the amount of data that you can get through just one. So, <clears throat> all right. All right, so here's just a quick example of. Uh, Oh my God, somebody's got my home IP. Um, this is a really good example of uh, what zero tier looks like. So I created a network in zero tier. So it's just a completely virtual network. Um, so these are all the nodes that are connected to that network. 
This bridge local is my actual bridge to my home virtual environment. Um, and then these are the three VPSs that I have right now, three different websites, three different IPs that are all tunneling to that same uh, honeypot. Actually, there's only one running right now for this demo, so um, we haven't tripled up on logs. And then just an example, too, of some, ex some of the extra rules. So that when I say software-defined networking, I can literally tell it what type of traffic down to the ARP level that can transit that switch. So there's quite a bit of uh, customization you can do in this. It's a really cool piece of software, but uh, a lot, a lot has allowed me to, to uh, change a lot of different implementations uh, and reach outside my network. All right, so getting to the point. So I don't know why I've had issues with my MacBook uh, internet dying uh, tonight, so we'll see how responsive this is. I can get the dashboard up. I'm going to give that a second to roll here. We are going to... While that's loading. So um, I picked up, I uh, just want to talk about the domain that I picked up for a little bit. So uh, diffkey.com, I have no clue what it was. Well, actually, I went back and uh, picked it up. So this is expireddomain.com. Um, if you're a red teamer and you have to stand up your own C2, you kind of uh, spend a couple of days living on this website. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there that have their own APIs that uh, you, can, you can query this. Um, but you can basically sort domains that uh, fall off, that expire, that people don't renew uh, by their, their Alexa ranking, their, basically their internet ranking, how many uh, related links there are to it. So this is one of the ways I choose my domains for uh, both C2 and for uh, external honeypots. Just a good way to drive up traffic. So I found DiffKey on there. Apparently it was some high school student's college project on how to securely share communications using a QR code or something. Anyway, he had a couple hundred uh, reference links to it from an external site, so that's a, it was a pretty good pickup for $12. So, um, uh, okay, Kabani, you're green. And this is the, the, the demo gods, so. Let's see if I can get this going here. All right, bridge is up. There we go. All right. Boom. Uh, the only downside uh, to using something like zero tier uh, to do this is uh, the traffic has to uh, flow back to the same pipe twice, so I'm doubling my traffic. So the honeypot uses 14 gigs versus seven, so. Uh, all right, so here's an example. So uh, again, this is Teapot, fully open source, built on, uh, built on Elk Stack. So uh, you guys done a lot of customization to the log stash inputs. So we are going to, I want to say I stood this up the night of the 15th at like 1130 at night. So let's see here. If we can get return year to date. Maybe. Next time I'm videoing all my demos. Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if it's like their wireless or something on the Mac. It could be the Mac. Um, so just some of the other tools that, uh, while we're waiting for this load, that come with it. So it comes with a fully self-contained like CyberChef. So they pull in their own copy. Uh, Spiderfoot is like a uh, open source uh, research tool, so you can punch an IP into it and it can launch off a bunch of scans. Ah, just want this dashboard to load once. So um, I think as of last night, I said this up the night of the 15th, I had over 300,000 hits on most of my honeypot services. So and that's from a single IP uh, since the night of the 15th. So, uh. So, um, let's see here. Uh, 
Here's, a, here's an example. So this is everything you get uh, if you play with teapot. So there's uh, uh, five different sensor types of teapots. So I'm running what they call the next gen, which uses glutton versus honey trap. So, but all of this work has been done for you. It can run in a completely self-contained in, in one VM. Uh, so again, this is probably what I would recommend if anyone asks, uh, hey, do you, I want to stand up a honeypot, how do I get going, would be to uh, spin up a VM, uh, load teapot on it, and then uh, start forwarding stuff to it. So it's a really good example of a uh, polished tool. And let me see here if I can. There we go. This is an example of the, the dashboard. So this is what you're not seeing, uh, live data. So uh, yes, dashboards for every single uh, for every single type of honeypot that's running. Um, and a lot of different, uh, the met, uh, metrics already calculated out for you, a lot of different visualizations pulled through. Um, so uh, geolocation's all set up. So. Uh, some examples of the, of the data that you can pull from this. So uh, he's running a honeypot, but then there's also Suricata running on this too. So it's already got uh, built-in IDS, not a traditional honeypot, but so you can actually go through, look at a hit on a honeypot and correlate it to Suricata, uh, a Suricata rule that's already running on that. So was it detected? Um, well, what was it categorized as? Um, using uh, Dianea, uh, that's actually probably the, the largest number of attacks and they don't actually show it, it doesn't actually, uh, count against you on Dianea, but uh, I think I've had like two million SMB uh, Eternal Blue exploit attempts on that uh, VM I stood up last night. So they don't even put it on there because it just wrecks your numbers. So uh, if SMB is open on the internet, now it's a bad time. So, um, uh, but you can actually see the, the bytecode. It'll actually store the bytecode from you for all the exploits. Um, it, let's see here, I don't think I can show you, but there's a tag cloud. Oh, did we come up? No. it's it's. Just taunting me right now. Uh, there's a there's a word cloud that it uh, 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 builds for you for all the pa uh, username password combinations. So which is uh, great. I've actually picked up some new ones that I didn't have on any password list. So I'm like, yeah, red team, um, I can use this. Um, so uh, like I said, uh, completely open source, uh, all in one VM. Um, it's all running on Docker, so it's actually fairly easy to go in and tweak and run and tear apart. So I've got a version that I'm running that I rip out the Elk stack and I, and I pull it back into another ingester. So it chopped the resource utilization about in half, but it's still, again, uh, I have my own infrastructure at home. I like to use it so I can upgrade every year because I got a budget, but, um, but just a good example of some of the, the data that you can collect. So I'll have to take a look. A home internet connection could possibly be dying too, so. But. Okay. Uh, well, I wish the demo would have worked, but that pretty much wraps it up for now. Does anyone have any questions at all? I think you kind of answered it. Can you, you can rip out the default elk stack and make maybe your own threat hunting stack or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it, everything logs to a, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the question was if you can rip out the elk stack and, and uh, basically port, it, port all the data that's collecting over to your own stack, definitely. So, um, I mean, you could technically have it, uh, if you're running Elk or some other tool, you could have it query Elasticsearch and pull the data straight from there as JSON. Um, or you can, you, uh, the log files are all text. It has its own uh, log rotate in, uh, engine, not engine, it's a very long bash script that, that he wrote uh, to rotate the logs, zip the information. Um, so one of the things that this does too is uh, one of the things that helps them justify building this on the clock and providing it for free is there's something called EWS poster. We talked about it as a form of logging. Um, they, they actually have a live attack map for this. So everyone that runs one of these publicly goes back to a big database um, and then actually plays for live. Everyone knows what, remembers Norse, right? You know, that awesome attack map that was basically JavaScript that you could go in and look and see all the fake stuff they were putting in there. Um, so this is actually real. These are real honeypots feeding into a real attack map, um, generating real data. So you can opt out of that. Uh, and they provide instructions for how to do that on their GitHub. It's very easy. So they're very open about the data they share. You can actually open it, take a look. So, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, I see it as kind of providing a, a community service too. Uh, again, as an information security professional, this is something I like to be able to contribute to that community, uh, help stop bad guys. So um, I'm hoping that, uh, you know, this talk helps generate that interest and people realize how easy it is to stand this up and it can be done fairly cheaply. It's fun to play with. Um, fun to get your feet wet, uh, and you're also helping uh, provide fidelity on bad guys, so. 
Any other questions? Yes. All right. Oh, I did have one last thing. So, if you t yeah, if you, so if you talk at SecDSM, uh, the first time you get a free T-shirt. Well, I've given a couple talks before, so I jokingly asked for an elliptical curve rainbow unicorn T-shirt, not one of those silly RSA ones. So, and uh, I, I don't know. I guess somebody was listening. So I got this pretty awesome shirt for talking tonight. So I just want to bring that. It's, it's getting tweeted out. So. Uh, I'll, I'll, it, it'll get put on here. Don't worry. So we're gonna ride the unicorn. All right. So all right. Thanks everyone. So uh, uh, like I said, uh, I'm wishful thinking, hopeful, but I have a CFP in for B sides that's gonna extend this talk by quite a bit. We're gonna actually get into some of the, more of the red team stuff I want to talk about. Thank you guys for being my beta test audience as always. Uh, appreciate it. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be wandering around on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Subra. That was amazing.